<coughs> yeah, live on YouTube. Eleven, you don't have fever, no? You're coughing, yes. sore throat. <laughs> yes, sir. Sir, requesting for leave because I have. No, no. Purposely, I put her in a day, on a day when I don't come. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm safe. <laughs> okay. Hello, Jim. Are you sharing? One minute. No, no. One minute. Yeah. No, no, no. Just, just no, a minute. No, no. And letting everybody inside. Amma, see waiting room cut pani illa ma. We don't need that. And we are live. Okay. <coughs> Jim, Jim, are we live? Yeah, we are live. Jim, yes. uh, I see the multiple windows on the side. How do I cut it? Is it Just, okay? No, go up. You see that height thumbnail video. Just press that. It'll go. Okay, sir. I will skip. Yeah, you can start. Uh, start okay. Okay. Yes, yeah, sir. A very good evening to you all. Welcome back to the fourth session of Ask Your Mentor, an initiative by the AOMSI, Tamil Nadu, and Pondicherry branch. Today's session is exclusively on trauma, and there is so much to look forward to. Dear students, just before we start, the usual instructions. Kindly mute your audio, disable the video, and remember to take the MCQ test at the end of the session. This has been announced many times, but still repeat for your benefit. To get your certificates, you must have participated in a minimum of eight sessions. And for those of you who are not able to enter the Zoom meet, join us on YouTube. Okay, now we'll move on to the show. Today we have amidst us two very eminent and exemplary teachers as mentors and a very popular new generation teacher as moderator to clarify your doubts. The mentor for the session on mandibular and soft tissue trauma is Professor Ravindran Sir, who is currently the Dean of Faculty of Dental Sciences, Sri Ramchandra University, and is also the Chair of Dental Staff Executive Committee and Dental Education Unit of the same university. He was elected the President of AOMSI, Tamil Nadu and Pondicherry He's a consultant maxillofacial surgeon at Vijaya Hospital. A well-recognized faculty of the AO organization, Sir is also a PhD and has been an examiner to many universities in India, as well as Malaysia. He was recently awarded the Best Dental Professor Award in London for his almost 30 years of dedicated teaching and contribution to the scientific world with numerous publications in journals and textbooks. Such an honor to have you here, Sir. Welcome. The mentor for the session on mid-phase trauma is Professor Krishna Kumar Raja, sir. He is presently the head of the surgery department at SRM Dental College, Ramapuram. With numerous publications in journals and textbooks, he is part of the editorial advisory board of the SRM Journal of Dental Sciences and also a member of the Ethical Committee for Research. An avid researcher, he has innovated many surgical techniques which are published in journals of international repute and has also devised novel instruments to aid in surgical procedures. He was elected the treasurer of Tamil Nadu AMSI <clears throat> in 2012, and is also the president-elect of 2021. A regular course faculty of the AOCMF, he is also one of the advisors of ANAMAYA, which is an Indo-Pacific cleft prevention program. He was the recipient of the prestigious Best Dentist Award by the Tamil Nadu Dr. MGR University. We welcome you, sir. The moderator of both the sessions is Professor Nadin Sir, who is affiliated to the Department of Maxillofacial Surgery, Ragas Dental College, Chennai, since 1999. He has been a keynote speaker for various national and international conferences. He has been a faculty for implant training program and also been the course coordinator for orthognathic workshops in national and midterm AMSA conference. He is an EC member of AMSA <clears throat> for the last two years and also a faculty for AO Foundation. As the chief consultant of Apollo Specialty Hospitals Chennai, his focus is on orthognathic surgery, trauma, cleft and implantology. He's won the best delegate paper award in the National AMSA Conference in 2010, and the best delegate poster award in British Indian Maxillofacial Conference in 2010, both of them being very prestigious. We welcome you, sir. Thank you. Just introduction. Thank you. 
we start today's session. May I request Dr. Nathan to kindly take over. Yep. Thank you, Venil, for that uh, wonderful introduction. It's my privilege and I thank uh, the Tamil Nadu AMSA for giving me this opportunity to be uh, you know, moderating this session with two pioneers of our field, Dr. Ravindran and Dr. Uh, Krishna Kumar, sir. And, um, uh, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful initiative by our Tamil Nadu because, uh, you know, in this lockdown time, uh, I think this is a great initiative for the PGs to keep their brain wire little active because it's mainly focused on the postgraduates. So uh, I'm happy to moderate the session. We'll start the first session, which is mid-phase and upper-phase with Dr. KK. Uh, Dr. Krishna Kumar. So can I start? Yeah, okay. Thanks, thanks. Uh, be before you start, uh, let me thank uh, AMSI Tamil Nadu and uh, Pondicherry and uh, of course uh, the the hard work and efforts of Jimson and uh, and Ilevenil. And uh, I think uh, this is an excellent session. Uh, I'm sure all the PGs will benefit, especially students who are going to take up, take up the exams in the coming few months. Thanks, uh, Jimson. We can start now. Okay. Yeah. So I'll go on with the first question. Yeah. So we're starting with a very tricky question for you as the first question itself. How do you check consciousness in a patient in emergency who's blind or deaf or probably both? Okay. <laughs> So now uh, patients uh, who's uh, uh, patients who are blind and deaf, uh, uh, it might be a little difficult to assess their uh, GCS uh, because uh, it's very important uh, for the verbal response because it contributes uh, to evaluating a person's awareness. And uh, while these could be assessed through other formats like writing, uh, letter, word, words, the tool does not provide for this. So uh, the, actually the issues of uh, concern uh, in, uh, can be in addition to uh, not necessarily in patients who are uh, deaf and blind, uh, there can be other factors. This is uh, for the uh, for the uh, uh, for the for inf for the information of the postgraduates. They should understand that there can be other pre-existing factors also which can uh, interfere with the GCS assessment. You know, like uh, the language barriers, neurological deficits, hearing loss, or uh, deaf patients, and uh, patients who are on uh, you know who, who have been intubated. Or, uh, and patients who are uh, sedated, so and the patients who have had orbital injury. So these are kind of patients uh, from whom it's very difficult to uh, assess uh, the, the GCS. So uh, in such cases, uh, do not use number one to record missing components. Use NT, which says non-testable. Is, is that okay, Nathan? Yes, sir. Uh, I mean, the, just to add on that, uh, you know, we do, we use uh, NT, uh, which is non-testable. Yes. Yeah. And if you if you use NT, we don't give a total GCS score because that can misguide the clinician who is going to be seeing the cases. And uh, possibly, like you said, it not necessarily these two. We can also, if the patient is unconscious, we are only going to look at airway and intubation and stuff like that. So this is only talking about a conscious patient, probably an altered conscious patient in the emergency where we can still evaluate the motor response like tongue movements, yeah. eye movements, and uh, you know other motor components. So uh, the point here is only two, sir. I mean, basically NT means we don't really give a total GC score, Correct. plus we can check the motor components, sir, actually. So the, the motor component is uh, the most important uh, response that you have to check okay, in yes, sir. these patients, whether the eye and verbal yeah. Uh, can be of, uh, of in uh, in useful in lesser degrees. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. We move on to the next question. Uh, if patient with the GCS score of seven, what will be your primary management uh, survey and management, sir? Because we know at the GCS seven, it is pretty critical. Kindly. Yeah. Yes. So uh, the primary survey, as uh, as uh, illustrated here. Uh, 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 of the patient uh, follows uh, the strict uh, protocol of A, B, C, D, E, you know, uh, airway, uh, uh, breathing, uh, circulation, disability, and exposure to, to 
to the uh, exposure environment. So we'll have to necessarily, I think, follow the same uh, same uh, protocol uh, even for patients with uh, GCS seven. Okay, so on arrival, the patient uh, uh, undergoes a primary survey, which is uh, the ABCDE, and then uh, uh, all concurrent uh, life-saving resuscitation, which includes uh, pulse oximetry, ECG monitoring, BP, blood results, chest X-ray, pelvic X-ray, and then reassess the uh, the uh, primary survey uh, following uh, the uh, the uh, life-saving resuscitation uh, uh, procedures and then go on to secondary survey, competency head and neck, which is basically uh, head to toe examination and then followed by definitive care. Okay. Yes, sir. So if, if, if there is on the little continuation on that, if at all you, you, if there is an airway issue and if you suspect a cervical spine injury, I think this is what we are going to follow. I yes. mean, you can, you can tell us about that, sir, actually, if you, have a suspected cervical spine injury, then, you know, whether we do a tracheostomy or we do an intubation or, you know, this is the perfect table, which is showing that actually there is an apnea. If you do an oral intubation. Yeah. Okay. Do, yeah. Mm. So that is, oh, okay. Fine. So uh, if you suspect the cervical spine injury, then you will have to follow this algorithm. Uh, oxygenate uh, and uh, if there's apnea you will have to uh, do a orotracheal intubation in line with the c-spine immobilization if uh, unable to intubate then you'll have to plan a surgical airway okay and in severe maxillofacial injuries if you're unable to intubate surgical airway and uh, and uh, if uh, the breathing is normal orotracheal or nasotracheal intubation in line with c-spine immobilization and if it's unable to, if you're unable to intubate, then pharmacological adjunct orotracheal intubation. And again, if it's difficult to intubate, you'll have to plan for your surgical uh, airway. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can, Great, can sir. Be, yeah. Mm -hmm. Tracheostomy or uh, cryotherapy. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. I'll just move on to the next question. This is actually the continuation of the first question, which we already. What would you do in as a secondary survey, particularly to maxillofacial surgery? Yeah, secondary survey is uh, basically uh, a complete head and head to toe physical examination, okay, to identify all the anatomical injuries, isn't it? Uh, but uh, so basically, uh, after a, a thorough uh, history uh, and uh, a sample, it's a history which involves the signs and symptoms, allergies, medication, past history. Uh, last oral intake and events leading to the incidents. The secondary survey, yeah, uh, if you want to uh, think in terms of the mnemonics, it has to be, you know, the head and uh, head and skull, the maxillofacial, the cervical spine, the chest, abdomen, the pelvis, the perineum, but uh, the orifices, the neurological, musculoskeletal, the diagnostic tests, which is, and definitive care. Okay, so yeah. so basically, what uh, we do. Uh, uh, when we do the secondary survey is uh, to completely examine uh, head to toe okay, when you look we are thinking in terms of allergies you know so medications particularly cardiac uh, anticoagulation diabetic medications and then um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, environment events and uh, environmental like blunt injuries penetrating injuries environmental injuries like uh, 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 burns cold or chemical radiological injuries. So it has to be a detailed examination. Okay? Unless you complete a detailed secondary survey, you will not be able to proceed uh, to the next level of definitive care. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. So uh, just uh, adding on that, on uh, the secondary survey, if it is a severe maxillofacial uh, injury, then probably, like for example, if the patients had a, a you know, uh, lifoid uh, one or two and the maxillary completely gone back and you know, imagine they're still intubated still you can actually disimple in some amount of bleeding can be controlled, controlled uh, yes. uh, symphysis true. fracture which is displaced yeah a symphysis fracture which is displaced you can just still put a wire around like a interdental wiring and reduce the fracture and uh, you know basically controlling of the bleeding with our maxillofacial measures like you know, yeah. putting in a, a interdental so that, wiring that, to reduce yeah. the fracture that is after and, you hmm, yeah 
Yes, sir. Go so, ahead. Go uh, ahead, brother. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, and you know, if the maxilla has completely gone back, obstructing the airway, even though if they have intubated, it's nice to pull the maxilla out and keep it so that the posterior airway will get a little free. And uh, and any suturing, like if you have a tongue cut, you know, it can bleed very badly, and so probably do some, you know, simple, uh, uh, you know, hemostasis sutures on the lip and the tongue, which is highly vascular and can cause a loss of intraoral bleeding for yeah, the patient. Yeah, correct. So I so think that is after your yeah. secondary survey, then uh, you will decide yeah. to do your definitive care, like what you said, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank okay. you, sir. We'll move on. Nathan, you are muted. Nathan, you are muted. Hello, Nathan. Can you hear? Nathan, Nathan is muted. Nathan. Yeah. I okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Now, fine. now yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, intraoperative imaging of zygomatico maxillo facial yeah. complex fracture. What are yeah. the indications and contraindications? When will you want to do an imaging intraoperatively or when you now, just... Yeah. Now, when it comes to imaging, I think, uh, remember the, uh, on Sunday when we had the webinar, I said uh, uh, to avoid intraoperative complications. So when we're talking about intraoperative complications in addition to all the other uh, technical surgical complications, uh, a, a perfect uh, alignment uh, and uh, uh, you know, reduction of the zygomatic complex is important. And to uh, before you fix and before you uh, move the patient out of the uh, operation theater, I think it's a good idea to image these patients intraoperatively. And there are various techniques to do that. You know, some of them are this ultrasonic scanning, uh, which was uh, performed uh, with a real time linear electric scanner employing five megahertz transducer and whatever. This method is considered reliable and useful uh, for uh, repositioning the fragments of zygomatic arch fractures. CM, of course, this is one, uh, one uh, equipment which is available in most, almost all the theaters, operation theaters around the country, anywhere else. So it, it is also a, a good uh, uh, aid to uh, image uh, post-operative after reduction and uh, it is useful for uh, you know, zygomatic arch fractures, but it is very difficult to assess this reduction, especially in the, the zygomatic or, or the, uh, the, tem, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, sphenoid uh, uh, si uh, fracture sites. And then there are other uh, devices like the mobile fluoroscopic devices. But there is also, uh, 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 now it's, uh, uh, nowadays uh, you have these, uh, the, uh, Intro uh, inside the operation theater, you have uh, CT scans, you know, and uh, one of the the, na the navigation uh, surgery, sir. The not navigation, navigation the uh, mm. CT scans where you can pour, uh, do a CT scan immediately in the theater okay. after you fix it. There's okay. also a, a CT scan called the uh, C ring. You know, it, it it's similar to a C arm, but it is a CT scan which you can you know, move. Uh, on the patients, uh, you know, around him in the theater table, and then assess. So, interrupted navigation uh, is uh, what is the question? Uh, what are the various things, sir? Actually, these three imaging, the, interoperative image, imaging. Only yeah, three things, yeah. sir. Ultrasound. Because navigation is uh, totally different. We're talking only about imaging, yeah, basically yeah. to 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 make assess. sure that assess the outcome. Yes, uh, of your fixation, yeah. Yes, sir. That's fine, sir. Thank you. I think you can add add this uh, O-ring O-ring CT scan, which is also quite, uh, though not available in our uh, yes, sir. setup. So, so this is regarding the uh, order of fixation for zygomatic uh, complex fractures, and uh, when will you? Uh, what will be the order of fixation? That is the question. The second question, along with that, is uh, when to fix zygomatic spinoid suture. And what is the surgical approach for that? Okay, so the yeah, so this is this is uh, basically a slide uh, uh, telling us uh, uh, the various fixation, the one point, two point, and three point fixation. 
But if you ask me the order of uh, fixation, I think the first uh, first uh, fracture, uh, the fracture site to fix should be the zygomatic or frontal, the zygomatic or frontal. Okay, followed by the the uh, zygomatic or temporal, and then the zygomatic or maxillary, and finally the zygomatic or splenoid. Okay. Now, uh, if if uh, okay. there there was an interesting study by Manson et al. in 1990, you know, where they did it. A CT based uh, uh, assessment of uh, facial fracture treatment. Okay? And they divided uh, the fractures into, uh, for, uh, uh, into low energy injuries, uh, middle energy injuries, and high energy injuries. So if it's a low energy injury, the treatment is uh, you know, no treatment or sim to simple treatment, uh, conservative management. Middle energy uh, injuries uh, will require standard surgical approaches, whereas high energy will require dramatic instability, where there's dramatic instability of uh, the segments, will require multiple surgical approaches. So uh, what is the second question, Nadan? What approach is it? Uh, approach, yes, sir. Yeah, uh, approach, approach to the... Uh, uh, Zygomaticospinoid. Uh, yeah, Zygomaticospinoid, uh, of course, uh, the, the best approach would be the, uh, the subconjunctival uh, along with the lateral uh, uh, canthotomy. I think that would be the best approach because you'll be able to access uh, the infraorbital uh, rim, you'll be able to access the, uh, uh, the uh, frontozygomatic, uh, frontozygomatic suture line and also the zygomaticospinoid. So that should be the uh, best access. And uh, 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 if you look at this uh, diagram, the, uh, the accuracy of reduction descending order would be, you know, the, the zygomatic uh, spinoid would be the, uh, the uh, most accurate. So if you have uh, uh, reduced adequately and got your zygomatic spinoid suture well uh, reduced, I think that is the uh, best uh, accurate uh, reduction followed by the zygomatic arch and the third is the zygomatic maxillary buttress and intraoptal rim finally the zygomatic frontal suture line okay yes, and sir. the stability of fixation is again the zygomatic uh, maxillary is the least uh, and the intraoptal is the best because of the, uh, uh, the rigidity of bones yes sir okay yeah yes sir so that's a nice order. Basically, the idea is to when you when you fix anatomically the zygomatic complex, you are making sure your width of the face is maintained because your zygomatic arch is the key for you know the width of the face definition. Actually, sir, I have a question from the chat. Actually, yeah. will the masseter muscle influence the zygomatic complex fracture? The the yeah, theoretically, yes. They say the masseter influences. You know that's why. Uh, in, for example, uh, the uh, in injuries, uh, low level injuries, where they say there is no treatment or simple treatment, uh, we are talking about an undisplaced zygoma. Uh, but, uh, you know, theoretically, I mean, there is just a possibility that the mesita can pull the zygoma down. That's why you ask these patients to be on soft and liquid diet for a few weeks, you know, but actually it really doesn't happen. You know? Okay. Any 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 suggestions from uh, Dr. Ravindran because uh, so the, the zygomatic arch if it is uh, in two or three bits then the masseter will have a role to pull it okay. down okay but if it is a single point fracture on the zygomatic arch then uh, there's nothing to be worried uh, the, when okay. it's comminuted it, it definitely the masseter has a role over there to displace it. Okay. And uh, when we reduce it, most of the time it becomes a over reduction unless you fix Correct. the zygomatic arch. So, mm. so, so what, what did you suggest in such uh, cases where the uh, comminuted fracture zygomatic arch? Uh, would you suggest? Uh, uh, if it is comminuted and, and if it's. Uh, the but end, but there is no there is no uh, uh, functional or. Uh, uh, acidic uh, uh, deficit, then would you still go ahead and fix it or would you put the patient on soft if, if, if I'm sure that there is good amount of uh, stability of the zygoma, the three points where you said, uh, yeah. mainly the lateral wall, the inferior wall and the buttress area, yeah. then probably I will just try to reduce it and leave it with it. Okay. 
then attempting to think uh, fix it. But if it, if these points are not stable, then then I will have to definitely fix the zygomatic arch to give stability. Okay. So I, I think I think it's fair enough, sir. I think so. Basically, we go from the uh, stable to the unstable. I mean, that is how I think we yeah. understand yeah. stable to the unstable bone, so that you know we, we get more uh, you know the best anatomical reduction for it. Correct. I'll go on to the next question, sir. Uh, so how will you manage a malunited? Uh, this is more like a secondary deformity correction. Malunited zygomatic maxillary fracture, sir. Okay. So. Uh, mal united zygomatic uh, zygomatic complex fractures i mean basically uh, the patients come to us for uh, for two complaints one is either uh, functional you know basically where they cannot open their mouth because of uh, you know either the fusion or uh, restriction of uh, mouth opening because of the obstruction of the coronoid to the zygomatic arch in the complex or because of the cosmetic defect so if it is because of a functional uh, uh, problem, then I think we'll have to necessarily uh, go ahead and re and uh, refracture and uh, fix it. Uh, uh, here, the, of course, it says that prominence of the complex is important for facial aesthetics. So yes. if, uh, if, if it's only the uh, aesthetics which is of concern, then you can use all these uh, uh, augmenting uh, uh, materials like autogenous alloplastic uh, or various base osteotomies. Uh, but, um, but I would uh, uh, personally feel uh, with, uh, with the availability of uh, technology now, uh, like uh, the stereolithographic models, uh, navigation, surgery, uh, and uh, all that kind of technology. Yes. Well, we should be able to, I think, uh, we should uh, uh, insist and uh, encourage more of uh, uh, osteotomy and uh, uh, refracturing and repositioning uh, uh, the zygoma rather than using any of these, uh, uh, these, these uh, augmenting uh, augmented, yes, sir. materials. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Oh, Sorry, if I can add, with the stereolithography models, yeah. we're able to understand the pattern of displacement before we were working without them. Correct. And uh, so those augmenting procedures were look good. Correct. But now since we are able to understand with the models much better, we can plan the amount where we want to do the osteotomies and move the segments. Correct. Yeah. So and actually, actually, we are uh, uh, slowly even the stereolithic uh, lithographic models also are becoming outdated because we are doing all surgical planning. Vir virtual planning. You can virtual be planning. Yeah. So I think uh, the advances in uh, technology will really help in, uh, you know, achieving very good results because uh, yes, sir. whatever uh, uh, whatever skill you have still is very difficult to exactly uh, get your symmetry with uh, these kinds of osteotomies. Yeah. Yes, sir. So, but uh, just to add on that, uh, in stereolithographic model planning, uh, like how we mirror the orbit, if there is only an unilateral deformity and the other side is really normal, we can mirror the other zygoma to the normal we can side. Do, yeah. yeah, and we can get a prefabricated plate uh, which can be printed out. Uh, and you know, which becomes very easy intro. That's what I said. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm. Uh, all you have to do is in osteotomy, bring that to that plate and just plate it. I mean, true. If you so have, you uh, if you actually, have, yeah. yeah, you don't even require the model in hand. You can just plan it. You know? Yeah. Uh, so. yeah. Now the you other know. thing is, in case a customized plate uh, is difficult, you can still use those models where you are virtually plan and pre-bend the plates on those models. Yes, Take sir. it like that to the theater, use it as your splint, as well as once you have brought it to position, you can use the same plate to fix it. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah and actually you can also use, uh, yes. uh, actually you can also use a lot of materials, like you can use titanium, you can use, uh, uh, you know, uh, silicon, you can use uh, uh, prefabricated, you know, uh, pre-printed. Uh, peak models, you know, peak processes. So it's, I think the 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 uh, possibilities are uh, the options are there. A lot options. of options. So it again depends on how much the patient can afford, and uh, uh, so I think we should be yes, able sir. to do anything to get these things corrected. Yeah. Yes, sir. 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 Yeah
Yes, sir. That is uh, fine, sir, for this. But uh, we were talking about, the, like you said, function and the aesthetics. So, right. if it functionally, if the patient has got a little difficulty in mouth opening, would you want to do, other than repositioning the side gum, or do you want to do anything else? Yeah, I think the simple uh, technique of doing intraoral choroidectomy. Yes, sir. Yeah, very yes. useful procedure. Very simple. Yeah. Can yeah. be done very uh, fast and really achieves yeah. good results. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. So we, and sir, uh, gunshot injuries. You know, we don't see much here in for this part of the country, but still, you know, this is more like a question for the viva for the PGs. So, what are the types and management product, protocols, sir? Actually, so yeah, as you said, gun gunshot. Yeah, I have I have never seen a gunshot injury in my life. I've seen <laughs> post post. I've had few patients from Iran. You know, after that, uh, uh, the splinters and. Uh, the grenade shots, but they're not gunshots. So uh, I think we should just follow this uh, protocol by uh, uh, Mish Pellet, uh, you know, uh, based on their experience. So I think you'll have to basically follow all the uh, principles of uh, uh, primary survey and secondary survey that we uh, follow for uh, any uh, maxillary patient injury. So primary life-saving and organ preservation procedures, you know, intubation of arrival, C-spine, uh, radiography, direct pressure and packing for hemostasis, hemodynamic stabilization in accordance uh, with the ATLS uh, protocols. Then imaging, uh, 3D CT or plain CT, uh, non-contrast CT, uh, and then uh, interdisciplinary patient evaluation, which is, uh, you know, you'll have to always uh, uh, coordinate with your other specialists like the ophthalmologists and the neurosurgeons and the plastic surgeons and uh, to establish a list of diagnosis and formulation of a multidisciplinary prioritized, prioritized uh, treatment planning. And then of course, tracheostomy and percutaneous gastrotomy in the theater in highly avulsive and complex injuries. And, uh, and at the same time, uh, I think since you can't postpone these surgeries, you'll have to go ahead and uh, restore and stabilize the maximum and uh, uh, the uh, segments. And then and follow the basic principles of uh, internal fixation for uh, these uh, fractured segments. Tissue preservation very important because there can be a lot of uh, tissue damage in uh, in uh, gunshot injuries. Uh, Nathan, the previous slide, please. I'm sorry, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. And then so uh, meticulous primary care in our like, so soft tissue need uh, the help of a plastic surgeon to get a good approximation is the closure. And immediate bone grafting, a lot of times you require bone grafts in such cases because of the uh, uh, severity of the injury. So you might have to uh, choose uh, harvesting the bone from one of the sites. It can be the uh, iliac crest or uh, the rib or the calvarium. And then secondary reconstruction uh, uh, at a later date for uh, completion of uh, uh, to achieve good aesthetics and function. Okay. Yes, and sir. the types, of course, are uh, you know, two, the gunshot wounds and the shotgun, the pellet wounds, pellet are the, uh, the hand grenade kind of thing. So gunshot can be divided into low energy and high energy. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, thank you, sir. So basically, this is, uh, uh, unlike the trauma, these gunshot injuries, these high velocity injuries. So uh, like sir said, we might, not just put, if you want to do it anatomically together, we might have to do both hard tissue and soft tissue grafting based on the need of the case, maybe as a primary thing or as a secondary, just to you know make it complete actually. So we'll move on to the next question, sir. Uh, yeah. Is there any ideal uh, uh, guidelines for like the ideal lines of osteosynthesis, like uh, Shanti's lines of osteosynthesis, uh, mandible, like do we have anything in the maxilla? Yeah, maxilla, I think uh, uh, you'll have to just follow the buttresses, isn't it? So, yeah, see the, the buttress, the vertical and the horizontal yes, buttresses. So, uh, the stability of these fractures uh, depends on where you're going to uh, fix those uh, the rigid plates, you know. So, if you see in that order, uh, the, the, the best sites would be the orbital rim, uh, the zygomatic bones, the piriform aperture, the zygomatico maxillary buttress, the zygomatico 
max uh, frontal buttress and these are going to be temporal buttress so basically you'll have to uh, depending upon the nature of injury and uh, uh, based on the decision as to uh, how and where you're going to fix but you will have to follow these uh, uh, six uh, buttresses the horizontal and the vertical buttresses if you follow those buttresses they are like uh, the champis lines you know uh, yes. and i think you will be able to achieve very good and stable fixation here okay yeah that's all right nandan uh, thank you sir so yeah. let me on to the yeah that's fine sir i think that's the i think the butter they have the thickest bone so your fixation is also more uh, uh, stable yeah. and rigid in these areas uh, if you see the vertical butter as you can see when you played along the piriform rim is very thick because you have a triangle shaped bone there yeah. as you move little posterior you will have the anterior wall of sinus which is very thin there we can't play it at all so these vertical and horizontal butters are the perfect uh, you know zones for a stable fixation and of course uh, you know stable uh, stability of fixation oh, so yeah, that is yeah. fi okay. fine sir okay so, so we move on to the next question sir examination of the nasal injuries like uh, so how do you go about it and how do you manage a uh, uh, csf leak oh okay oh that's a nice uh, trauma nasal trauma i love them so uh, examination is uh, basically your um, history and physical examination Uh, under history, you have, uh, as it is uh, very clearly uh, put here, uh, the mechanism of injury, the uh, time since injury is very important. The time since injury is very important. Age of the patient, and then differentiation between acute or chronic pre-existing uh, deformity. Okay. So, and physical examination is uh, the most important. Physical examination is CSF rhinorrhea, and epistaxis hypostasia. Uh, and then obvious mal position of the nose uh, the periorbital ecchymosis hematoma tenderness to palpation and the palpable deformity so the based on i mean uh, based on the history and uh, thorough physical examination you decide and plan whether to operate or not to operate on these patients so uh, if there is no nasal fracture that is uh, if you uh, you can see the Uh, nasal fracture classification is uh, type one is only soft tissue injury, type two a is simple unilateral, type two b is simple bilateral, three is simple displaced, four is closed comminuted, and five is open comminuted and complicated or complicated. So, if it is a, a type one fracture which does not require surgical treatment, it will require just since it's only soft tissue injury, uh, ice pack, uh, and then discharge the patient uh, immediately. and then follow up and then uh, the uh, depending upon the time of injury you uh, depends uh, if it is uh, if the injury is happened less than 4 hours or more than 4 hours if it's less than 4 hours again and again it depends on the classification the type of fractures if it's a type a type 2a or type 2b or type 3 you require close reduction with splints with septal manipulation uh, so you will require extra nasal and intra nasal splints ice pack for 24 hours Uh, followed by heat for next seven days, and then if uh, after all this, if there's still nasal deformity after seven days, then you'll have to uh, go ahead and do uh, rhinoplasty with septoplasty, uh, controlled or controlled osteotomy if there is uh, gross displacement of the bony uh, nasal architecture. Then you might have to use threaded grafts uh, and the battens, and then hold the nasal bone using external splints and the internal splints. so uh, same thing goes for type 4 and type 5 fractures if if the duration of uh, uh, the uh, time of injury is more than 4 hours and um, uh, type 2 and, uh, and type 2 and type 4 fractures you'll have to necessarily uh, do uh, uh, rhinoplasty or septoplasty so you'll have to basically do a um, uh, surgical correction and there is no uh, there is no scope for any uh, uh, conservative management okay yes sir Alan? so if yeah. it is associated with you know the same kind of with some nasal leak if you find out any of these csf leak and you yeah. know like uh, so as we said the the primary symptoms and uh, csf leak is one of them I and mean, it depends on how how the uh, the classification the type of fracture uh, if uh, the patient complains of uh, this uh, salty post nasal drip and then Uh, and uh, the 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 halo sign, you know, on the filter paper, uh, 
uh, you know what so basically you'll have to uh, do a clinical thorough clinical examination yes, and the patient will uh, give you uh, the uh, clues to uh, a csf leak and then you'll have to investigate and uh, some of the investigative uh, techniques are the target sign you know target sign you know otherwise called the yes, ha halo sign and uh, it is uh, when the uh, blood and uh, the nasal discharge uh, uh, get mixed and then if you put a filter paper the blood moves closer and and the uh, csf moves away so it forms kind of a halo you know very clearly and you can have this handkerchief test which is also a test where you know either a handkerchief or a dry gauze uh, when the patient uh, covers his nose and then uh, the csf uh, is more likely to be clear and uh, not uh, sticky very clearly visible on this uh, uh, dry gauze and then you have uh, the uh, glucose oxidized test uh, which is uh, the csf glucose uh, uh, test uh, if you see uh, uh, in general the uh, the, the glucose oxidative strips uh, 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 when you use those strips to check the uh, glucose levels if uh, it is more than 20 milligrams per deciliter then it is positive the normal nasal discharge the glucose uh, concentration is only about 10 milligrams per uh, deciliter. Okay. Yes, and also it's very important uh, to do the, the B2 uh, transferrin. B1 is found in uh, serum, tears, nasal secretion, saliva, etc. But B2 is the only uh, uh, substance seen in uh, CSF, uh, the perilymph and the vitreous humor. So, and uh, since P2 transfer in specific in CSF, it is a well-known marker with extremely high sensitivity and specificity. So uh, I think it's a good investigatory technique to diagnose and confirm CSF leak. Yes. And of course, the, the glucose levels, uh, glucose levels, you know, the serum glucose is 0.5 to 0.67, then there's a higher possibility of uh, CSF leak. Okay? Uh, and then the chlorine concentration yes, is sir. 100 milliliters per liter then one must consider a CSF leak. And sure. finally, of course, uh, your final diagnosis also depends on your, uh, uh, in addition to your clinical examination, your CT and MRI. MRI. Okay. okay. So, so if, if, if there is a CSF, so if yeah. there is a... Yeah. Yes, so if there is a CSF leak, uh, then uh, conservative management or surgical repair. So. Uh, in a lot of times, I think uh, uh, a reduction and, uh, you know, reduction immobilization of fractures, it can uh, invariably uh, arrest the CSF leak. Okay? And then uh, if you have to still go ahead uh, and do a surgical intervention, then it depends on, you know, whether do an intracranial, extracranial, or transnasal endoscopic method. Okay? And uh, what are yes, these uh, techniques? <clears throat> What's the next question, uh, Yeah, Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. So we'll move on to the next question. What is a frontal uh, bone fracture classification and how do you manage it, sir, actually? Okay. So frontal bone, uh, uh, basically, you have the anterior table, the posterior table. Okay. So anterior table uh, fracture, it could be either my moderate displaced uh, fracture or a severe combination. Posterior table, large displacement or a moderate to severe combination. You can have a nasofrontal axis recess fracture, a dual tear or a fracture combination. Okay. And uh, this is the, the basic uh, uh, classification of frontal bone fractures. And of course the treatment uh, protocols will be uh, observation uh, and then uh, open reduction and fixation and obliteration and or cranialization depending upon the yes, uh, need. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. So that's it. And that's the references which you got it down for the yeah, protocol yeah. of frontal bone fracture. Yeah. We move on to the next question, sir. Now, role of STL model, stereolithographic models in maxillofacial trauma. I think we already discussed about sigmoid. I know, I know. Uh, Correct. Complex, yeah. complex fractures. Yeah. So basically, uh, this is a generalized thing. So you can give us a so, generalized yeah. thing of what I, is the role in maxillofacial trauma. Yeah, as as we discussed earlier, you know these the, all these things which uh, all these points which are enumerated are uh, are the advantages of using uh, SLA model. You know, uh, uh, very useful in diagnosis in treatment planning. So what you have is a three D model in hand, and you'll be able to exactly diagnose and plan your treatment. 
you'll be able to directly visualize the structures you can you can uh, uh, you can uh, uh, fabricate uh, surgical guides and templates and then it can be uh, very useful to practice uh, you know instead of uh, going on the in the theater and trying to uh, uh, you know bend these plates and you know struggle you can practice your procedure uh, pre operatively and then uh, so that you can reduce uh, the amount of time you spend in the theater and the accuracy of fixation and then of course assessment of bony defects for grafting adaptation and pre bending and pre contouring of plates fabrication of custom processes like the tm joint process distraction devices fixation devices and then the advantage of doing all this is reduces the surgical time the anesthetic time and the wound exposure duration and naturally that uh, is very important uh, to uh, to achieve a good post operative uh, uh, result you know and then the results are more predictable and then improved colleague communication and is an excellent education tool for patients as well as for uh, students uh, who want to learn procedures on these models yes okay. sir so yeah. yes sir superb so basically i think our sla models are completely uh, you know uh, revolutionized our treatment planning particularly in high morbid surgeries like uh, you know young patient and my stuff like that the more uh, the morbidity is very less because they are functionally back you know we can immediately do a you know a nice uh, model reconstruction and you know free flap and you know even implants on the uh, free flap so it is uh, very good so it is the probably the next step uh, which is helping a big way for maxillofacial surgery so moving on to the next question sir right angled instruments what are the indication and what is the Uh, you know have you used it and uh, you know have where do you use how comfortable are they so yeah right angle uh, instrumentation is i think uh, the the most uh, uh, most often used uh, uh, procedure i mean uh, conditions where it's used very often is for condylar fractures subcondylar fractures you know so you avoid an external scar and uh, and it is uh, it is a uh, Uh, excellent uh, instrument to use for intraoral fixa fixation of uh, uh, condylar fractures. Okay, uh, but uh, but uh, the the restrictions are the cost, uh, and of course uh, it cannot be used for all uh, condylar fractures. Uh, very low uh, subcondylar fractures are, uh, are fixed and uh, reduced and fixed very effectively with these uh, contralateral instruments. okay and also to a little extent you can use uh, for angle fractures so basically uh, this was Hello. devised yeah can you hear me nadan yes yeah, i can i can hear yeah. sir so basically this was devised to uh, to avoid an external scar an scar. external approach an external scar and it is a, a little technique sensitive procedure you need to get used to this instrument but once you get used to it and if the if the cost is not a, a burden for the patient i think this is a Uh, it's a very good uh, uh, instrument to use for condylar fractures and uh, to little extent for angle fractures yes sir. i think angle fracture i think instead of using a uh, trocar and trocar uh, yeah yeah trocar i right. think this can be a replacement for that particularly when the angle fracture is uh, going uh, more posterior distant more to posterior. the th th third molar True. you know the, if the fracture line is going more posterior possibly this will be uh, correct piece. yeah Uh, but we can also use it for uh, uh, you know orthognathic also if you're using a vertical ramus osteotomy and True. you want to create that so probably True. we can use that but but i think uh, we still have yeah basically any it. any any uh, mandibular ramus and the condyle procedures uh, fixation i think is a very good instrument to use yes sir yeah, yeah. so uh, we are almost uh, coming to the end you i think this is an one more common question Which we keep asking the postgraduate during the why what so what what is a pure bloat what is an impure bloat fracture sir yeah yeah now then uh, tell tell that uh, this thing uh, can answer that question yes sir please sir yeah yeah now then I thought you were going to answer this question no okay you, uh, yeah uh, uh, bloat is uh, something uh, which is uh, exclusively 
uh, only the orbit you know maybe one of the walls of the orbit uh, maybe a floor or a medial wall or a superior wall or lateral wall it is exclusively contained within the orbital rim the minute the uh, the fracture is associated along with the you know the zygomatic buttress or the arch or anything it becomes an impure so isolated pure bloat is only within the orbital walls impure something which is also involved in the zygomatic complex that's a simple thing and yeah, uh, okay so th th we are uh, thank you sir that's excellent we are end of this session with dr kk uh, but sir we have a couple of questions which people have asked i think yeah. already answered one question which is like uh, it is better to go for a coronoidectomy or osteotomy in malignant zygomatic complex fractures with complaints of restricted mouth i think we answered that i think basically it depends yeah. on the function and aesthetics Aesthet so we if want aesthetics is not a, a concern then i think you can go ahead and just do a coronoidectomy because yeah. yes. basically uh, the idea is only to open the mouth so a very simple technique and very effective also yeah yes sir and the other question is uh, is there any role of fillers in malignant zygoma fillers no fillers i don't think you can use for malignant zygoma fillers are more for you know nasolabial uh, yes. lip lip fillers and all that yes. because uh, malignant zygoma is more of a, a bony yeah. defect is bony. So an anatomical anatomical yeah so mm -hmm. either you okay. augment uh, with uh, uh, osteotomies or you use uh, one of these uh, uh yes, one of the uh, uh the materials available yeah yes sir thank you sir thank you, sir. Thank you nathan thank you very much perfect. yeah yeah perfect yes sir so just one more last question on any indication for uh, frontal sinus obliteration when do you i mean is that a call taken by the neurosurgeon when do they take it see basically frontal nasal obliteration is uh, uh it is uh, an endoscopic procedure where you know you just make a small incision uh, through the upper eyelid and then uh, you uh, go through the uh, frontal bone and uh, uh, remove the uh, remove the uh, sinus lining and all the you know the necrotic uh, tissues there so uh, yes, uh it is you know different from cranialization you know where yes, you remove sir. the posterior uh, Uh, wall and then uh, you use a pericranial flap and then uh, let the brain rest on the frontal bone after fixation so yes, there are two different uh, procedures but uh, it is basically to uh, clear the frontal sinus isn't it of uh, all the uh, necrotic materials and the sinus lining yes yeah okay. yes sir thank you sir thank you thank for you. that thank wonder, you. One, wonderful uh, thank you. session thank you thank you and anything i'm sure all the pgs and most of us are really you know have a very clear cut idea about what is what i think that's all the questions we have for you sir we move on to the dr venil can i move on to the next uh, uh, mentor yes, dr avindra yes yes, yes okay. sir we could we could yes sir so we'll go on with uh, so now we have dr ramendra the dean of uh, ramchandra medical dental college so sir is here with us to clarify all your doubts and questions regarding mandible and soft tissue injuries sir can i go with the first question the first sir. question is sir yes now then carry on yes sir first question is uh, what are the various approaches to mandible fracture and what situation would you want to do an extra oral approach uh when there are various factors which influences your decision making on the type of incision one if you have an external laceration yes sir and uh, if it is in relation to the fracture site then probably you could go through the same uh, extra oral uh, laceration to approach the bone and fix it that would be one simple thing as well as the other approaches to the extra oral and intra oral is if it's going to be a symphysis fracture or an angle fracture it would be a pro intra oral incision or vestibular incision as well as if it's going to be an extra oral incision if you are planning to fix the submandibular fracture then it's going to be a retromandibular uh, approach as well as if it is a high condylar fracture or uh, intracapsular fracture if you are going to fix it then it could be a preauricular approach or a tetramandibular uh, approach for it 
as well as a residence uh, approach for a submandibular could be if it is a comminuted mandibular fracture where probably you might have to do a low uh, bearing type of fixation where you might have to use a dynamic compression plate or you might have to use a uh, recon plate for it then that should be the area you can it has to be placed in the lower border so naturally you'll have to uh, use an extra oral approach for it and uh, these are the regular things approaches which you use for the man Submental, uh, usually for a symphysis fracture, unless it's a laceration, I don't prefer to have an incision in the submental region. But if it is going to be an atrophic mandible. Sir, I'm sorry to, see this, and I'm sorry to interrupt. We are not able to see the slides, sir. Yes, Madden, slides. sir. Madden. Okay. One second. Can you see now? No, it's only the first slide, nothing. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can, you, can you see now? The slide is seen. First slide is seen. It is not moving. You'll have to change. Okay, one second, sir. So the if it is an atrophic mandible, an edentulous mandible, in that case you have a buckle ha bucket handle like fracture or something like that, a submental approach or a visor incision in the submental region might be an ideal approach for fixation. Yes, sir. Wherein can you see the slide? Yes, sir. Now we yeah. can see. Okay, I just go through the. the... So maybe yeah. the first question also, sir, just the pictures. Yeah, this is the first question, actually. Uh, can you see it? Yes, Hello? Sir. Yes, sir. Hello? We can see. We can yeah. see. yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Is a, that is a question. Approaches to the mandible, sir, is answering only that. And uh, the need for extra oral approach. So these are the various approaches, sir, has already explained. Picture for submandibular, retromandibular. Now the slide uh, has to be changed. It's not moving. Sir, it is, it's not moving. We are still in the question. Yeah. Still in the, okay. Seen, sir? The question is seen. Uh, it is seen in my laptop, sir. I don't know. Yeah, question is seen. Question is seen. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Yeah. Now we are able to yeah. see. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Fine. So, yeah. So that's the uh, various thing. Is it okay, sir? Can I move on to the next question? Yeah. Okay. Yes, please. Yes. So should uh, the titanium plates, uh, you know, is the, is the screen visible, sir, to everybody? Yeah, it's visible. Yeah. Okay. Should the titanium plates what we use for fixation of uh, mandible fractures? You know, should it be removed after the you know its fulfillment of its use, or is there any particular indication to remove titanium manipulates? Okay, the five, uh, role of the implant is to stay there till the bone heals and consolidates. So generally, a bone is to heal about four to six weeks time, and for it to mature and uh, regain its functional strength, it takes about. Uh, three to six months time. Once that period is over, then the plate retained over there is only going to be as a foreign body. It's not going to have any role of uh, the, any role in retaining it inside the face or in the body. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, so there is no Clear evidence when we were using stainless steel plates, yes, we used to say it has to be removed because uh, you couldn't subject the patient to MRI or when they go into magnetic fields and things. There were concerns. But with titanium, there is no such 
issues to be worried about so can unless the plate is uh, felt if you have done a, used a recon plate the patient keeps complaining that the plate is palpable or uh, the uh, thing is you see signs of infection developing over that area or the skin getting stretched over that area which will lead to plate exposure later and these are the reasons for which you will have to remove the titanium plate yes sir yeah basically i think there is no problem i think you can leave it as such except that any of the, if the patient complains or if there is a lot of whatever you told us i think we will think of removing it sir otherwise titanium plates can be left in situ as such thank you sir we'll move on to the next question how do you manage a post operative silo seal a post operative silo seal in maxillofacial surgery is mostly going to be when you make an incision adjacent to the parotid gland uh, mostly in trauma following uh, exposure of the condyle to the retromandibular approach one of the common uh, things which we face the ideal thing is to keep aspirating over that area and uh, try to uh, reduce the bulk over that area and give uh, form the same uh, probably aspiration should be done once in two to three days so that you don't allow the collection over there and form dressing over there should be sufficient yes sir yeah sometimes if it is a very chronic thing uh, you know if there is a injury at the basic uh, the ductal level probably we can think of an intraoral catheter uh, you know ductal uh, uh, you know stabilization sir which can be done through the mouth actually but it's very rare as a thing unless it is so that's going to happen only if there is a laceration through the cheek yes, cheek exactly sir through yes. the cheek and thing yeah. but uh, yeah. usually Uh, that doesn't lead to an extra oral silo seal that developing there is going to be a leak intra orally so it might not be a big yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, non settling thing yeah finally you know people there are uh, literature talking about parotidectomy for uh, silo seal there is only on a chronic uh, case and completely You know, none of these meshes are working out, sir. So yeah. thank See, you, sir. If you if you question. keep draining it, if you keep draining it regularly, and you don't allow it to get accumulated, if you allow it to get accumulated. It's going to get into an abscess, and that's when the other things like more major things like parotidectomy and things like that. You keep uh, yes, draining it regularly and keep giving so pressure we, dressing. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. So we move on to the next question, sir. What is the role of 3D mini plates in mandibular fracture? What are the advantages and disadvantages? Uh, 3D mini plates. Yes, it's smaller in size compared to your uh, mini plates in the sense that lesser of uh, hard hardware over there. The biggest thing about uh, 3D plates is it should be the uh, horizontal arm or the vertical arm of the 3d plate should be running parallel to the fracture line that is very important when you are using a 3d uh, mini plate or recon plate over there and other thing is it can it is a ideal thing to be placed in the cases of uh, symphysis or paracymphysis fracture but uh, it's something which can't be used in the uh, mental region because of the, it will be intervening with the uh, mental nerve over there so what's the biggest discomfort of course it's minimizes the number of screws that can be placed and the hard that to be yes mainly can you Hello. I'm not. Your voice is Hello. not. Hello. Yeah. Can Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Now it's okay. Yeah. Mainly when you have an oblique. Yeah. When you have an oblique. Oblique fracture, fracture, fracture it might not be possible. 3D plate goes. Yeah, it will not be possible. I think other there you will have to. And if you have, let's say, uh, a fracture going through the mental nerve bundle, 
then you know adapting this place all around and you know that might get little complicated i think it is favorable for a nice straight line fracture right at the symphysis or at the parasymphysis you know that might rather than that i don't think this we can use a 3d so those are the advantages and the disadvantages you know on to the uh, okay. next question yes any yeah. specific classification of soft tissue so is there any specific classification of soft tissue injury uh, uh, yeah so generally soft tissue injuries you consider it as contusions abrasions lacerations the lacerations can be simple stellate or flap like there could be also be avulsive injuries where there is tissue loss there can be uh, injuries due to bite marks or bite injuries it can be human as well as animal and of course as kk said there can be soft tissue loss because of gunshot injury or explosions than by nature uh again the other classification of uh, soft tissue injuries or you consider it as clean clean contaminated contaminated and dirty of course any incision placed and uh, primary closure done in a theater setup it is uh, considered to be a clean uh, wound as well as clean contaminated is anything related to respiratory gi upper urinary tract and where it is entered with minimal contamination as well as contaminated is any fresh uh, traumatic injury or any traumatic wound it is considered to be a contaminated thing when there is an uncontrolled spillage or when there is minor break in sterile technique then also you call it as a contaminated wound usually it refers to any rupture which might occur on the surface uh, following an injury as well as dirty wounds or those which are open traumatic dirty traumatic perforations or follow viscous thing and which has frank pus which is uh, extracting from it, which constitutes about 28 to 70 percent of wounds okay fine sir thank you sir so we'll move on to the next question what is the criteria for managing a 11 year old boy with bilateral subcondylar fracture with an anterior open bite sir uh the thing the age here 11 years when you say 11 years of course the basic assessment of the patient is taken care of, like you look for the position of the patient the heart beat the breathing circulation and you do the definitive management of these things then after complete medical evaluation you look at what the goal of uh, any uh, trauma care or any condyla fracture thing is to restore the facial form try to get the patient to a pre morbid occlusion to restore uh, uh, total mandibular function and to improve the range of movements to the uh, normal pre morbid area so generally in children one thing which you at 11 year old age you will have to remember about uh doing an intermaxillary fixation so if you are going to do an intermaxillary fixation you will have to remember that that can be uh, the patient would be in a mixed dentition stage there could be some shredding pain or deciduous teeth over that area so you will have to avoid doing a intermaxillary fixation so for probably reducing the thing uh, open bite and thing you will have to give an occlusal splint and you will have to correct the occlusion and put the patient on intermaxillary fixation so the intermaxillary fixation for a person of about 11 years would be about 2 to 3 weeks period and after that the intermaxillary fixation is released and you mobilize the jaw actively in case the patient has uh, 
other medical conditions which uh, prevent you from doing an intermaxillary fixation, you will have to probably do an open reduction and fixation. When I say intermaxillary fixation, I'm not saying about tie wires or uh, interdental wires. I'm talking about the ideal thing is to place orthodontic, uh, orthodontic uh, uh, brackets and to that would be that. And uh, mostly in children, because you, in 11 year old, if there is any medical condition associated, then it's better to avoid uh, putting, uh, doing an intermaxillary fixation on a long duration. So probably you can give an occlusal splint which, uh, with a lingual plate, which could probably uh, do away, you can do away with the uh, intermaxillary fixation. Of course, if it's going to be a cornea fracture, you can use resolvable plates. So that, uh, and uh, there are some who advocate that it can be removed after the uh, fracture heals. But again, you are going to reopen extra orally again. So probably plates, uh, resolvable plates should uh, resolve within a year or a half. So you can leave the plates over there. It's not in the interdental area. So it can be used for fixing contacts in children. As well as if it is going to be in the dentition area, you will have to make sure that the resolvable plates are placed where you perforate only the outer cortex, you don't through, go through the both cortices. That's very really important. So the length of your screw uh, should uh, selection is very important. Yes, sir. So basically, we use only monocortical screws. Yeah, in case, in, ca in case we are doing yeah. an open reduction fixation. Definitely. Yes, sir. That's nice. Thank you. Sir. So we move on to the next question. Nine-year-old girl uh, with symphysis fracture of the mandible. What is your treatment model? Hello. Okay, uh, if, it is a nine, if it is a nine-year-old girl with symphysis fracture, what are you worried about is the root completion over the area. And again, about if you are going to do a plate fixation, about the, uh, probably the uninterrupted uh, tooth bed of the canine over the area. So those are things which you will have to have in mind. So the main thing is to look at the jaw function and it should be preserved as much as possible. Uh, you will have to be worried about uh, uh, the... Sorry, the previous slide. Uh, so you can use uh, brackets, uh, orthodontic brackets in these cases, and you will be able to fix it, uh, fix the, do an intermaxillary wiring for them for about two to three weeks. Or an alternative would be to use a lingual splint. Okay, you can do a take an impression, uh, do a model surgery on it, then uh, align it, construct a, a lingual splint with an occlusal wafer over it, or just a lingual splint, and fix it over the mandible. So then in that case, an uh, intermaxillary fixation might not be sufficient. Uh, necessary in the case. Resolvable uh, uh, ORAF if it's a terribly uh, displaced fracture. Now then you can, I think I've spoken about this. So, the role of occlusal splints in maxillofacial trauma, as I said, if there is, uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, if it is in mandible fracture, this is what I was talking to you about. You can take an impression, you can uh, do a model surgery, reduce the fracture, and you can have a 
occlusal splint done, just like how you do a by tracing of planes, and that can be fixed. And that should mostly be sufficient for reducing a fracture. And you leave it in. Probably, if you feel uh, it is not stable, you can do an intermaxillary fixation with it. Or you can uh, probably do a gunning split, and you can do a, a circumandibular wiring to stabilize the mandibular split, as well as you can probably fix it to the maxilla and do an intermaxillary. So this way you don't disturb the residual teeth. Nathan, you are muted. Nathan, you are muted. Unmute, please. So, in cases of geriatric patients, we will have to consider the medical uh, conditions of the patient. So, we will have to take into the consideration of the cardiac function, pulmonary function, impaired breathing abilities of aging that has to be taken into consideration to plan your incision. That's very important. You have to remember that with the aging, the endoscale blood supply to the mandible decreases. So it is more on uh, blood supply from the surrounding tissues and muscles. So you will have to remember that. So for planning your incision, you will have to uh, you will have to definitely uh, consider about the age of the patient. Yes, In case the patient is using a denture, a uh, pre-existing denture, probably you can use the denture and uh, remove the anterior to put in some uh, clasps in it so that you can use it for uh, close reduction and do an intermax reviving using it. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. What is the indication and contraindication for a dicapitular fracture, sir? Uh, well, dicapitular fracture is something which occurs within the joint space. So you know the condylar head is oblong, medio, distally. So most commonly, if the lateral head of the condyle is fractured and displaced either laterally or inferiorly, uh, that can be taken up for uh, fixation. As well as if the medial head is reduced, uh, is fractured, still the vertical height of the mandible or the ramus is not disturbed. So mostly if the occlusion is stable and the uh, mandibular movements are not restricted, probably you may not have to fix the condyle line. Probably, KK, I would like to have your opinion on this. Unmute, unmute. What is the question, Ravi? See, about uh, uh, high condylar fractures, whether it is uh, medial or lateral. Yeah, I say yeah. that uh, lateral, probably I will fix because that may cause a shortening of the length of the ramus. Correct. As well as medial, it doesn't interfere with the uh, vertical height of the ramus and obtusal disturbance is very less. Correct. Yeah. 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 I agree with you. Yeah. Agree. True. 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 Yeah. But uh, what 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 kind of fixation would you prefer in such a situation? Uh, if it is going to be a thing, I'll probably uh, use a screw fixation. Mode. Yeah. A single screw. Single uh, screw fixation. Yes. Yeah. Correct. So sometimes when we don't do that, uh, you tend to get this uh, bifid condyle, you know, over a long period of time. Yeah, I think I agree with you, Ravi. I think okay. that's a good option. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Nathan? Yes, Nathan. sir. So, how do you manage pregnant maxillary patient patients, sir? Actually, how do you manage pregnant patients? in maxillary patient surgery? Uh, see, usually when a, a pregnant lady comes in with a history of trauma uh, to the casualty, 
the first thing that has to be elicited, uh, first thing we will have to remember, it is the life of the mother and thing which has a primary concern. Uh, then the next thing is to you will have to ensure whether there has been any physical assault or any domestic injury. So that's very important for medical legal purpose. So these things have to be recorded first. And based on that, when you are seeing the patient, it's always better to put the patient on right platform. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> have the patient to uh, turn towards the right so that uh, there will not be, you never have the patient supine in them. Okay. That, that's very important. Because, and uh, intermaxillary. If you are able to stabilize the mandibular fracture, especially if it's in the anterior or in the body region, if you are able to stabilize the fragments using tire ears, that will be ideal. You will have to uh, see whether you can minimize anything of doing an intermaxillary fixation or uh, anything because nutrition for this patient is very important. So you will have to see whether you can minimize the period of intermaxillary fixation for them. So ideal is to do a tie here and try to stabilize the fragments. And once the patient's uh, condition improves, if she is able to tolerate and maintain her airway, you will have to probably take her as a secondary correction for the mandibular fracture if there is a malocclusion or a Hello. Uh, yes. I think all, almost all. Are... Hello. Yes, Nadan. Yes, sir. All our questions are completed, but I just wanted to complete with this question: What is load bearing and load sharing osteosynthesis, sir? Okay, this is uh, one of the most important thing when you are talking about any fixation, any ORAS. Carry. Uh, postgraduate will have to understand what the is the load bearing or whether it's a load sharing fixation. This is something you will have to say. When you say, sir, I will do plating, sir, I will put a plate, sir, I think. You will have to very clearly tell the examiner that whether you are going to use a load bearing system or you are going to use a load sharing system. A load bearing system is one where the plate bears the whole load. That's what is shown in the uh, picture here, where there is, it is usually done when there is a comminuted fracture or when there is a loss of bone. That's what you see in the first picture where the load bearing is. When there is loss of bone and thing, the plate is one which bears and that is the one which is going to stabilize. There is no buttressing of bone over there when you are using a load bearing thing. So the plates you can use as a load bearing are mostly the recon plates. Ideally, you will be recon plates with locking system, which are more load bearing, as well as plates which share the load along with the bone is known as load sharing. These are the mini plates which we use commonly or even the dynamic compression plates are considered to be load sharing plates. It's done nothing. Unmoved. And where do you place, uh, use the plates in the mandible? You know, uh, this is something again commonly asked question because these are basic things we expect a postgraduate to know when you appear for their exams. It's not whether how will you manage a complicated uh, facial maxillary thing. Uh, these are things. So what what, what is the uh, ideal line of osteosynthesis, which is something. Anyone, anyone who is doing maxillofacial surgery should know, even a first year should be able to answer. It is one single line along the external oblique ridge 
and running along up to the mental foramen. And past the mental foramen, it becomes to the, almost in relation to the uh, first premolar, first bicuspid to the opposite bicuspid. It divides into two lines. These are mainly because in the anterior region, there's more torsional forces over there because of the platysma and the suprahyoid muscles over there. So there is a tendency for torsion. So to overcome this torsion, you use two plates in the region between the bicuspids. <clears throat> next. The next commonly asked question is, what is locking and what is non-locking plates? So if you look at this uh, picture here, what you see in the top, in the plate, in the screw slot, you don't find any grooves over there or you don't find any treads over there. As well as in the locking plate, you find grooves in the uh, screw slot in the plate. So there is something that, as well as even the screw head, even the screw head will be having treads so that it just locks into the grooves in the plate. The indication for locking and non-locking or the advantage of non-locking over uh, uh, locking over non-locking is the adaptation of plate needn't be uh, accurate as what is needed in many plates when you use locking plates. But the disadvantage is it's very important that the drill hole should be perpendicular to the bone and it should not be angulated. That's the main thing when you use a locking plate in the school and a non-locking plate. This is something every postgraduate should remember. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that wonderful session. We've completed all our questions. In fact, the last three questions is what I personally added to you know make the regarding like mandible fracture these three things like knowing about the load sharing and load bearing plates and learning about shanties and locking and unlocking is very very important i will just take a couple of questions which has come sir so what will you do with the medially displaced condyle while the medially displaced what complication do you expect and how to avoid Hello, can you hear me, sir? Yeah, I'm just reading the question. Uh, another just okay, so what? In what medially displaced condyle while doing retrieval yeah. of. How, what, what complication do you expect? How to avoid that? Uh, okay, uh, one thing is medially displacement of fracture and tracking it is becomes difficult because of the pull of the lateral pterygoid muscle. Okay, so it is pulling it immediately. So that's one reason why I think. So it is important when you are trying to retrieve the thing on the medial displaced fracture, especially in a subcondylar fracture, it is very important that you depress the ramus. Okay, when you depress the ramus down with a hook or with a reverse Langham band, and then use a uh, bone holding forceps on the condyla head, it becomes a little easier to manipulate. Yes, sir. So, uh, anything about the nutrition, if you keep, uh, let's say we talked about a nine-year-old fracture, if when they keep on you know, maxillum mandibular fixation, any particular tip about the nutrition they should be given during that time? Uh, if you are going to the, that's one of the main reasons. See, when you are doing a gunning, if you are gunning splint for these children, you'll have to make sure that when you do the model surgery and you do the thing, it's more, I, more than doing the gunning splint, I prefer to use a sucker mandibular wiring and uh, fix the occlusal splint over that area once I'm sure that the occlusion is stable. So in that way, the patient will be able to move the jaw and uh, there is no compromise on the intake. That's my personal uh, thing. Uh, probably I would yes, like sir. KK or your opinion. Sir? Dr. KK? 
I think KK is. Jimson, you can. Jimson, you can add on. Yeah, sir. Uh, yes, we can. If you want me to add on, probably you know a high calorie diet. You know, high calorie diet with uh, high protein. And maybe you know, particularly for children, can be given the the feed. Only thing is, you know, a couple of very nutritious. Probably a supplement like uh, what you get uh, prepared. Uh, supplements are available. Yes, sir. that should be. Yes, sir. So I have another question here. Uh, if it is a child, and if you're doing a mandible fracture. Can a single plate can be done at the lower border for a pediatric patient with symphysis fracture? Symphysis, as I told you, the torsional force is going to be very heavy. So if you are yes. going to use a single plate over that area, it has to be a bone uh, load bearing plate, not a load sharing plate. A mini plate is going no. to be a load sharing plate. No, no, sir. What, what what age group no, but, is this another no, no, age? This you know pediatric patient eight year nine year symphysis fracture. Uh, the question is, can we just put one plate? You know what they really mean is probably they're thinking you know we do only one plate of lower body. It's as good as not putting a plate over there. It's as good not as not putting, putting a plate. Okay, okay, okay fine, that's good. Okay, 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 okay. Sir, uh, another question is: Will a cap splint cause any TMJ issues in children for fixing when you do a fixation? Uh, does it cause any, you know, TMJ issues? So again, uh, if it is a growing child, and if you are going to do a close reduction and a cap splint, I don't think it's it, it, the condyle is quite adaptive in that age. So unless you are going to immobilize the patient, uh, the child for a long time, I don't think it's going to lead to any. That's why if you have seen uh, the thing, we have said very clearly two weeks of immobilization and active moments after that period. Yes, sir. Yes, I think pediatric, we have to be very... Uh, and uh, you will have to keep reviewing uh, this you will have to review these kids for a long term period, probably initially every alternate week and uh, probably at least for one to two years post operative. Okay. Okay. All right, sir. I think that is, uh, we've taken most of the questions from that. Anything else to be added? So, have you uh, done any resorbable plates and uh, have you, do you have any long-term follow-up of resorbable plates? Uh, see, in 2005, I think one of the postgraduate's dissertation was on resorbable plates. And uh, at that time, the understanding was resorbable plates were not ideal for mandibular fixation. It was more ideal for the mid-face. And uh, uh, unless uh, it is very essential, I don't prefer to put a resorbable plate for the mandible. Can okay. can I just add? Can I just add a note on that? Yes, please. Yeah, no resorbable plates. Yes, uh, I I used to do quite a bit uh, those days when it was available. Now it's not available as freely as before. The the biggest problem uh, I have faced personally is uh, the identifying the hole. No, no, not, you not, only, to the plate. not only that. This the screw head tends to break. Break a lot. That's a big problem. So even for a mandible, you you can't uh, fix a, a two two mm plate. You have to necessarily fix a two point five, which becomes very thick. You know. So the other thing is, you will have to go when you drill. You will have to go. Up to the full depth, you can't full stop. Depth. You can't uh, stop. stop thing. Correct. And you will have to tap again and tap still the full depth. If you do it half, and then when you try uh, putting in the screw, to the screw tends to break. Correct. So you invariably you will have to over drill over that area and over tap. But I, I have found it uh, very useful for uh, condylar fractures. You know? So um, yeah, it's very good because you just uh, fix it and then it tends probably to probably I've up. used it more for uh, mid face than the mandible. Yeah. Okay. 
Well, uh, and also I felt uh, when you use a resorbable plate, the adaptation becomes very difficult even though you put in that hot water bath and stuff like that. You don't get a very satisfactory adaptation like how you get with the titanium plate, correct? Yeah, yeah that, that is true. The more than that, I have found it very difficult once you adapt it over the play, uh, bone. It's very difficult to distinguish the uh, screw hole in the plate. Okay. And uh, many a times there has been damage to the thing because you're not able to visualize it very clearly. In fact, I've spoken to the manufacturers about it many times whenever they come to me about it have some marking like what you have on the tiles tube or something over that so that you can distinguish the screw slot in the plate. But once you drill into or you damage the screw slot in the plate, then you have lost the whole advantage of it. It's as simple as just putting the plate and screw for names. For the cost, I found it very far. Perfect. Okay. Fine, sir. So uh, I have one more question. Uh, is extra corporal fixation of condyle uh, is good? I mean, can it be done? I mean, or is it? Do you have any advantages or disadvantages of it? Uh, it looks. Or uh, it's nice to hear that uh, when you say extra corporeal, it looks or uh, you think that it's very simple. It's not that simple to do extra corporeal <laughs> because you can take it out, you can adapt the plate over there, you can bend it, but when you try to insert it back, you do land up with a lot of problems. It's not that simple. Again, uh, if you look at the long term follow up of these things, those fragments tend to resolve. Okay. The incidence of resorption is very high. Yes, sir. So it has been yes, totally sir. denuded. Yes, yes sir. Mm. I, I think long-term follow-up, there is a lot of resorption also in that, sir, actually, in uh, you know, the content, because it gets uh, completely stripped off all the soft tissue and muscular attachment. Well, the condyle's so blood, yeah. condyle's blood yeah. supply is only from the surrounding tissues and yes, stripping it, totally. if it yeah if it's a longer segment then it's easy to you know yeah. fix it but if it's small, if it's a it's not possible. not possible not not uh, advisable definitely yeah yes so that comes so absorption is uh, commonly seen because of the uh, lack of vascularity actually uh, mm -hmm. dr krishna kumar sir we have one question for you yeah. Uh, so how how do you check the neuro neurologic assessment of an alcoholic patient in an RTA? <coughs> alcoholic patient in an RTA. Oh, that's a nice question. I actually yes, don't sir. know. I don't know the answer. <laughs> See, alcoholic patient, you cannot assess. Yeah. The patient is invariably going to keep either quiet or. Hello. Yeah. Hello, I can't hear Ravi. Ravi is muted. Yeah, so look at the other parameters of consideration. Correct. Yeah, but is it is it so important at that time to assess the neurological deficit? You're talking about what kind of deficit you're asking? So invariably, when. Hello. Yeah, Ravi, can't yeah. hear you. Sir, I can't hear you, sir. Hello. I, I think sir's internet is in trouble. trouble. So, okay. yeah, no problem. So, anyway, sir, I think we've answered. Dr. Vainil, are you there? Yes, sir. Yeah, I think we've answered all the questions, I think, whatever you sent to me. And um, I can I can I end the session? <laughs> uh, Jim, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I think yeah. we're done. Dr. Jim, are, are you there? Are you there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. we, we, we've gone almost uh, one and a half hours. I think we've taken almost half an hour more than... Yeah, I think we started at uh, 8.5. I think it's 9.40 now. So, And uh, uh, I think uh, both of our uh, mentors gave some uh, really valuable information for the postgraduates and with a lot of clarity and uh, experience. I think it's going to be very helpful for them, you know, for their you know, exam preparation and of course, answering for a viva and all that. So I thank uh, 
both uh, uh, Dr. Kumaraja and Dr. Ravindran for this uh, wonderful session. Uh, I thank uh, Jim and Venan for coordinating this for the excellent session. I think we've done whatever uh, best uh, for the postgraduate. I think it's a great effort. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan, for that excellent uh, moderation. Thank you, sir. Uh, and uh, thanks again, uh, Jimson, Illuminal, and of course, uh, Rina, our president. She, I think she was also there in the mm -hmm. session. So thank you very much. I hope it was useful to the postgraduates. And uh, thanks again for this excellent uh, opportunity. Uh, and thank you. Yes. Thank you. Jim? Yeah, yeah. 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 Is Thank the president you. is the president is online or the president is off? President is here. She's she's here. Hi, Dr. Nadin. Yes. The, I think Why president. Thanks Thank for you. the opportunity. I think you should have or uh, you know final words before you I close. You wouldn't miss that, no. <laughs> Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Dr. KK and Dr. Ravindran sir for this wonderful presentation and the time and effort. Such a lot of time of yours being taken. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Jimson, Dr. Venil, Dr. Nadin. Excellent, excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, now uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, KK, sir. Thank you, Dr. Ravi, sir, and uh, Nadin. Uh, thank you, Jim, sir. Uh, uh, Madam said uh, it is. This preparation, if you have to speak for this one hour, uh, you need to prefer for at least for two days. So thank you for the time and uh, your hard work. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Jimson. And, uh, Dr. Yeah. And, I think, and, uh, I, I, you can, sir, I sir. think we, we, we were actually working harder than our post students in the last one week. <laughs> yeah, nice to yeah, spend so much time. Academics. Thanks, thanks, Jensen. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you yeah. Sir, can I yeah, post? No, uh, yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Yeah. Now then you can stop the screen sharing. Okay. Sir, I've uh, posted the link. Can you post it in that uh, WhatsApp uh, so that I can post it in right, sir. YouTube? I'm not able to copy it from you. We'll do that, sir. Jimson, what time is it there? Sir, one forty-five, sir. Oh. Okay. One forty-five. Four. A.M. Oh, A.M. Oh my God. Okay. Oh, yeah, Australia, yeah, there, Kanda. Yeah, yeah, tell you. Four hours, sir. Sleepless night, sir, Jimson. <laughs> <laughs> The dedicated secretary, sir. Seriously. <laughs> no. I got dedicated. No, 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 but no one, I've never seen anyone do so much in such a short time. It's a nice yeah. thing. Yeah. It comes with innovative ideas. It's yeah. the big thing about And I think thanks to the lockdown, he has so much time. So. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Oh, people are hearing us still. Yeah, people are hearing us still. Yeah, yeah. No, no, they are still hearing us. Yeah. When are yeah. you posting? You are posting some. I, I, I have posted, sir. Okay. So you are waiting for the. You are waiting for the response. It's already in the chat box. What What is she okay. posting? Sir, it is an MCQ but, test. After every yeah. session, we give them a test. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, sir. <laughs> no, sir. The question is uh, taken from the presentation. Okay. So there are five questions. 
So the PGs have to answer, and then we take the data. And if they have uh, uh, participated in eight out of ten sessions, then they get a certificate. So three more minutes to go.
participants who have completed the workout. Chimson, sir, it's actually time. Yeah, then you can close. Can we close yeah. the session? Okay. Yeah. We'll close it. Closed. Hello. So just close. Yeah, yeah, done. Just, just closing it. Kisko akan cha hamko phone karke. Arey re 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 re. Sir, it's done. Thank you. So we'll end the session. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So officially, again, on behalf of the yeah. uh, Tamil Nadu and Pondicherry chapter, um, I wish to thank the mentors and the moderator for enriching this program with their input. Thank you once again, Ravindran sir, KK sir, Nadan sir, for this super informative session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ravindran. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank. Thank you all. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. You need rest, Jamsan. Yeah, yeah. Go and sleep well. Go yeah. sleep, man. Go. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Ravi. Thank Ravi. Good night. night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Yeah. yeah. Thank President, you, sir. Yeah. President, yeah. President yeah. madam. Good night, madam. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Reena. Reena. Good night. Good night. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, and good night. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, President. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Nadan. Thank you, Nadan. For everything. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.